Morphling. It was once considered the most powerful creature in all of magic. It was so powerful that it was given the nickname of one of the most overpowered fictional characters of all time, Superman. Like Superman, Morphling has a whole lot of special abilities that make it really powerful. Morphling's time as the most powerful creature in magic is in the distant past at this point, so that begs the question, how good was Morphling, actually? This video is sponsored by Card Kingdom. Use the links in the description to visit their store. Hi everyone, I'm Nietzsche Hone, and it's time for another edition of How Good Was It? In this series, I take a deep dive into a single card and discuss its competitive history. So far, I've looked at Sarah Angel, Mog Fanatic, Icy Manipulator, and Hypnotic Spectre, so check out those videos if you haven't seen them. I always run a poll to let viewers decide the topic of this series, and this time I pitted two heavily played creatures from the late 90s and early 2000s against one another, Verdant Force and Morphling. Morphling won fairly handily in the end, so let's answer the question that so many of you want to know. How good was Morphling, actually? Morphling was printed in 1998's Urza Saga. For three generic and two blue, it's a 3-3 with five activated abilities. You can pay one blue to untap it, or give it flying, or give it shroud until end of turn. Flying makes it hard to block Morphling, shroud makes it hard to kill, and untapping means your opponent has to worry about those things during their turn, too. Morphling's other two abilities cost one generic and can either give it plus one minus one or minus one plus one until end of turn. This means your opponent can never be sure what Morphling's stat line is going to be. You can see why Morphling would be dubbed Superman. It flies, it's pretty much invulnerable thanks to Shroud and its ability to raise its toughness, and it can hit really hard. However, Morphling wasn't exactly Superman right out of the gate. There would be seven months between when it was printed and when it achieved its first top eight at a major event. There were a few reasons for this. First, Urza Saga was an absurdly powerful set that immediately broke several formats. Decks built around the absurd mana production of Tolarian Academy and the absurd card draw of Windfall and Time Spiral dominated every event in late 1998. And once they finally got around to banning those, they printed Memory Jar in the next set, which was even more busted. Basically, the release of Urza Block ushered in a period known as Combo Winter, where creature decks were at a major disadvantage because of the power of those cards. You didn't need to run creatures to win when you could just draw your whole deck and produce a bunch of mana. But by March 1999, all of these cards had been banned in multiple formats, largely bringing this period of combo degeneracy to an end, although later in the year they ended up needing to ban even more cards, especially in the non-rotating formats, but that's a topic for another video. So yeah, things already were looking up for Morphling at this point, as the metagame was settling into a place where more traditional decks could thrive, but a rules change with the release of 6th edition made things even better. As with Mog Fanatic, a card we looked at earlier in this series, Morphling was the beneficiary of the introduction of the stack. Before this, the game used a batch system that worked similarly to the stack in many ways. For example, the now-defunct Interrupt and Mana Source card types worked differently than other cards, and damage also worked differently. Damage from spells didn't resolve until the rest of a batch did. In most ways, 6th edition simplified these rules with the introduction of the stack, and things largely work the same today as they did back in 1999, with one exception. Combat damage used the stack back then. So how does that help Morphling? Well, because of its ability to augment its stats. Here's an example. Let's imagine you're attacking into an opponent's Sarah Angel. When combat damage used the stack, you could then activate the ability once to buff Morphling's power all the way to 4. You would then put that combat damage on the stack, and then use Morphling's abilities to buff its toughness up to 5. Then when combat damage resolved, the Sarah Angel would take 4 and die, and your Morphling would take 4 from the Angel and survive thanks to its 5th toughness. In other words, if the player who controls Morphling has mana available, it's pretty difficult for any creature to succeed against it in combat. So Morphling was largely irrelevant for the first 7 months of its existence. But this all changed following the end of Combo Winter and the introduction of combat damage on the stack. It achieved two top eights at the first major event following these changes. This was the Block Constructed Pro Tour in May of 1999. 
Block Constructed was a format with a card pool of only the three Urza's sets introduced between 1998 and 1999, and this top eight would mark the beginning of a period of multi-format dominance that only came to an end several years later, in 2003. And the role it served in at this Pro Tour is a role that would be very common for it going forward. It was the main win condition in a control deck. Control was a great place for Morphling, since for Morphling to be at its very best, you need to have a bunch of mana untapped even during your opponent's turn. Control decks often pass the turn without using very much mana, since they frequently operate entirely at instant speed. Even just a threat of activation on Morphling's abilities often meant your opponent couldn't really do anything, so this whole strategy was often very mana efficient. Not long after that, Morphling also started to see play in mono blue control decks in Standard. With the larger card pool, it was even easier for Standard decks to leave a bunch of mana up for counter magic and card draw spells while getting in for damage with Morphling every single turn. It also performed similarly in extended mono blue control decks, extended being a rotating format with a much larger number of sets than standard, and in extended, Morphling saw play alongside the best counterspell of all time, Force of Will, which was pretty much its best friend. When Pro Tour Chicago came around that same year, three extended Morphling decks finished in the top eight. One of these was a mono blue control deck like those we've already covered, but the other two were something entirely different. Bob Maher won the whole event with an Oath of Druids deck. The Oath is a powerful enchantment that during a player's upkeep, lets that player reveal cards from the top of their library until they hit a creature and put it directly into play, provided the opponent controls more creatures. Bob's deck ran three singleton creatures that it could hit with the Oath. Two of them were utility creatures that gave themselves up for value. Shard Phoenix could wipe the board of small creatures, and Spike Feeder could gain you life. This guaranteed your opponent would never get their own Oath trigger. So if you hit those, you usually activated those abilities to slow the game down and then make sure they die so you get another Oath trigger. And the win condition for the deck was none other than Morphling. That's right, when tasked with coming up with the most imposing creature to win a game while using Oath of Druids in the extended of 1999, the answer was Morphling. After all, it was nigh unkillable and could end the game in just a few swings. This was especially true if you were putting it into play in the extreme early game. To put that into perspective, Oath of Druids decks are still a thing in Vintage right now, and they usually try to win with Atraxa. So in some ways, Morphling was the Atraxa of the time, except in some ways it was even more dominant, because it wasn't only played in decks that tried to cheat it into play. So now, Morphling was the win condition of choice in both control decks and decks looking to cheat creatures into play. For the next several years, Morphling continued to dominate in both Standard and Extended in both of these types of decks. However, after being the dominant control deck win condition for three years, a new creature started to take up some of Morphling's share of that role in 2002, and that creature was Psychotog. In fact, Morphling's very last top eight and extended came alongside the Tog at Grand Prix New Orleans in 2003. It only appeared as a singleton copy, while there were three copies of Psychotog. Morphling still had a couple of years left in extended, but it never saw play in the format again before rotating out of the format, because Psychotog was considered the better option. The Tog could do some of the stuff Morphling could, namely it could change its stats, but it was cheaper to get into play and could be buffed for no mana at all. Its ceiling was also pretty close to limitless, as you could win the game in a single swing with Psychotog, not something Morphling could ever accomplish. It also synergized nicely with control deck game plans, which often involved having lots of cards in hand and in graveyards, and it combined really well with Madness cards like Circular Logic, since you could discard it to get a huge discount, and it also worked incredibly well alongside one of the best cards in Extended at the time, Fact or Fiction. It didn't matter how your opponent would divide the stack. You'd get tons of value thanks to the Tog's ability. Morphling, meanwhile, didn't have any of that sort of synergy. Now, Psychotog didn't have everything. It couldn't become evasive all on its own like Morphling could, and it wasn't quite as challenging to kill, as it didn't have Shroud. But its other strengths made it a more appealing win condition overall, and after Grand Prix New Orleans in 2003, Control Decks went with a full four Psychotogs and no Morphlings at all. While I haven't done an episode of this series on Psychotog, I have done something pretty close. I covered Psychotog decks in my Deck History series, so if you want to know more about Dr. Teeth, check out that video. It's sort of a sequel to this one, if you're curious about how Control Decks and Extended looked after Morphling. 
Anyway, while Morphling may have slowed down a bit before rotating out of Extended, it was still being played as the main win condition in Control decks and other formats. Blue was simply the strongest color in Vintage. After all, it gives you early access to Ancestral Recall and Time Walk, not to mention Force of Will, Mana Drain, and more. So the format is insanely powerful, and even in Vintage, if you could resolve a Morphling with mana up, there was very little way for the opponent to deal with it, thanks to Shroud. Given its success in Vintage, it probably doesn't surprise you that Morphling was also good in Legacy, which really started to become the format we think of today in 2005. Before that, it was very much just Vintage Light, basically Vintage without the Power 9. But in 2005, it became significantly different from Vintage, since it received its own substantially distinct ban list, and not one that was only informed by what was restricted in Vintage. During this early era of Legacy, Morphling once again found itself ending games for control decks, most frequently in mono-blue control decks. However, by 2008, Morphling had completely disappeared from all of Magic's 60-card formats. Creature-based aggro decks had become much more potent by this point, and now, putting a 3-3 into play and hoping that it could stand up against Goblin Piledriver or Blastoderm was a really bad idea. Both of these creatures avoided most blue interaction while swinging incredibly hard. As creatures became increasingly strong on the whole, Morphling sunk into irrelevance. Of course, Morphling is really only irrelevant if we're looking at how good it is in competitive Magic, because it's one of Magic's most iconic cards. So much so that they've designed many cards that are homages to it over the years. Aetherling is probably the most notable Morphling reference. This is because it had a very similar career to Morphling's many years later, albeit only limited to Standard. It was more expensive than Morphling at 4 generic and 2 blue, but it also had better base stats as a 4-5. It retained the ability to give itself plus one, minus one, and vice versa for one generic mana, and its other two abilities were similar to Morphling's too. For one blue, you could exile it and return it to the battlefield under its owner's control at the beginning of the next end step. In other words, you could use it to dodge removal, in this case, even board sweepers, and its other ability made it straight up unblockable. Like Morphling, it was a dominant control deck win condition, but its success was only limited to standard. These days, every color has a Morphling. Every card in the cycle has a name ending with Ling, the ability to raise their power and lower their toughness and vice versa for one generic, and three other color-appropriate abilities. They even use the art of these cards as a callback for Morphling, except for Thornling. They really need to reprint it with art to go with the other four. It's not like we don't see reprint sets all the time these days. Come on, Watsy, give us a Thornling that looks like its cycle mates. Anyway, to conclude, let's answer the question. How good was Morphling, actually? Well, for a period between 1999 and 2002, it was arguably the best creature in the game, no matter the format. It was played as a control deck win condition, and it was cheated into play with Oath of Druids. It was incredibly difficult to beat once it stuck on the battlefield, so you were very likely to see it if you were playing any format it was legal in during the time. Even after it lost its title as the best control deck win condition to Psychotog, it remained a somewhat relevant card in at least some formats all the way until 2008. The numbers also show us that Morphling was a dominant card. Between 1999 and 2008, it achieved one World's Top 8, 10 Pro Tour Top 8s including 3 wins, and 26 Regional and Grand Prix Top 8s. For a time, between 1999 and 2002, Morphling really was Superman. So that's the history of Morphling. If you enjoyed this video, please like it and share it so that others can enjoy it too. If you want to have a say in what card I talk about in the next video, go check out the community tab and vote in the poll. Thanks for watching.